I say you did that better than most of the students in here, so thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brian Thompson. I am the president of UWM Research Foundation and the director of the Bar Entrepreneurship Center. It's my honor to welcome you here to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and uh, for today's event. I want to acknowledge uh, Senator Taylor and the other uh, members of the legislature that are here either in person or online. I know there's a big online following of this event, so it speaks to the uh, interest and importance of the event today. Uh, a quick note about where we are today in the Lubar Entrepreneurship Center. Um, our goal here at UWM is to make entrepreneurship and innovation part of every UWM student's journey. Not that we believe they will all go on to start companies. Some of them will, I love that. But more importantly, we think they will be more valuable contributors in their own companies or in working for other people and adding value in our society, having these skills in innovation entrepreneurship. And I think that uh, that theme of adding value is also important to today's, and being a contributor in society is also important to today's topic as well. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the people that have helped make this possible, the Lubar family and others, uh, supporters of the work we do here. It's important and we're really honored to be a part of it. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Mike Pickles, who is the president of the Badger Institute, and uh, wish you a successful program. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for, thanks for having us. And uh, I, too, want to uh, acknowledge folks who are here in person, and Senator, uh, for now, Senator Taylor. Um, and uh, we have uh, a variety of other folks who are joining us from Old, and I want to thank them for participating as well. Kevin Carr, I know the Secretary of uh, the Department of Corrections is and I uh, want to acknowledge uh, Kevin. I, I think that uh, judges. Them. I also, um, I also you all want to thank uh, Kelly Thompson, who's our state public defender, is tuning in. and. And I also want to thank David Lubar. David, uh, the Lubar name obviously is going to sound familiar. We are in the Lubar Entrepreneurship Center. David's also on our board and has really been instrumental in helping us move forward in a lot of ways, including on these really important workforce and corrections issues. So, and Brian, thank you for thank you for having us and, and for hosting us here. Um, Reentry re is a bipartisan concern. I was just talking to Senator Taylor about it. Enormously consequential. Uh, Senator Carr could probably give us the up-to-the-minute statistics, but there are currently approximately 20,000 people incarcerated in our prisons in Wisconsin. There are approximately, I think, another 63,000 people who are under some type of supervision. So that's 80,000 people in this state. That's approximately the, the population of Racine. Uh, at the Badger Institute, we use policy, research, and journalism to ensure opportunity. That's, that's what we do. We believe, in, we believe in education, we believe in jobs, we believe in public safety. We also believe in individual responsibility and aspiration, which uh, to me is another way really of saying the same thing. That's why we're so excited to hear the perspectives of those who have studied reentry, have been on the front lines, and to have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, to wit, I think, I hope, uh, eventually, if you are tuning in uh, remotely, there will be a link on your screen that you can use to ask questions, and they will come to me on an iPad. There's also a number to which you can text questions as we as we go on. There'll be a couple of different opportunities uh, to to ask questions. So um, I'll be the conduit. I'll review the questions. I'll make sure they're not redundant. I uh, won't be the censor. Uh, just be the conduit, but uh, we'll ask them at the appropriate times. So we are thrilled at the Badger Institute to be a part of this. Uh, we're thankful to have smart people here, like Peter Moreno from the Odyssey Project. Uh, I met Peter only remotely. We haven't met in person, um, but we met. There's Peter. <laughs> you look different in person with your mask on, Peter. But um, we met remotely after an introduction by uh, Steven Skolaski at the Oscar Rennebaum Foundation. And we'll make sure to share this video with, uh, with Stephen as well. Uh, thanks in advance to you, Peter, for telling us a little more about the work you're doing. Uh, Peter, please. Thanks, Mike, for that nice introduction. And I'm going to try to dislodge here. Is it OK if I move around a bit? I'm OK with that. Thanks, Mike, for that introduction, and uh, I'm very excited to be here with our guests from Nevada and also the exciting panel we're going to be having uh, talking about uh, the, the work that's being done on the research end in reentry. 
Um, can we go ahead and put up that slide, please? I'm going to talk a bit about uh, three things. One, the Odyssey Project and how it uh, came to be at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, thing is how Odyssey Beyond Bars grew out of the Odyssey Project and as a part of the UW System Prison Education Initiative. And then third, very briefly, why I'm here and why we're excited about this issue and why we're excited to learn uh, from our guests we have uh, coming later today. So the Odyssey Project is now in its 19th year at UW-Madison. It's a part of the university. And it began as an education outreach project, uh, working with folks living in poverty in the community in Dane County. And the idea with the Odyssey Project is to give folks who uh, maybe are not in a position economically where they have had access, prior access to higher education opportunities, but have the curiosity and the desire to learn, give these folks an opportunity to get a taste of college and at the same time use that as a kind of jumpstart program, combining it with wraparound supports like advising and tutoring, alumni support, so they can use that experience in the Odyssey class as a springboard to a college degree. Not all of our not all of our students go on to college degrees necessarily, but most of them do go on to more college. And we're finding the, the other aspects of uh, the impacts on folks' lives after they take the, the, the Odyssey program are becoming evident in other ways. So because this is focused, focused on people living in poverty, we're paying attention as to the economic impacts of involvement in the Odyssey program. What we're seeing is people who go through Odyssey, their household income after a period of average five or six years goes up by about $18,000 a year. We're finding that although not all of them have earned college degrees, they are going on to more college. They're talking to their kids about more college. So most of our students say they're, they're better able to talk to their children about the importance of college. Their kids are starting to talk about not if I go to college, but when I go to college. So we're seeing a lot of these uh, ripple effects of the Odyssey program, uh, as, especially as we continue to grow and take care of our alumni. So I've mentioned al alumni a couple times. That is a huge part of what Odyssey does. So we have a part of Odyssey called Onward Odyssey. After you take that initial core year-long course in the humanities through Odyssey and you're done and you want to do more, we have advisors from UW-Madison who will work with you. We have an on-staff social worker who will help you work through some of those barriers to getting uh, pursuing higher education. And in general, just creates a sense of community around those learners and those aspiring learners that want to go on and, and recast their lives through the lens of education. So that's, that's what Odyssey is all about. In 2019, Two years ago now, we decided to take what was working so well in the community in Dane County and apply it to the prison system. So we began teaching in 2019 a uh, credit-bearing college-level course in basic uh, writing composition, English 100 at UW-Madison. We started teaching that at Oak Hill Correctional to 15 men at a time uh, in 2019. That has caught on like wildfire. Everyone at Oak Hill is receptive to it. The students love it. There's tremendous demand for it. We're seeing things, we're seeing our students write things like this. And I'll just read it to folks who can't, who can't see the screen. I took this class to become a better writer. It has helped me become, to become a better father, son, and person as a whole. And these are pictures of uh, some of our former students in the past couple years. So when I heard Mike's introduction talking about personal responsibility, it really resonated with really what I think the core of what Odyssey does. So a lot of people talk, when they, when they look at what Odyssey does, they look at the humanities curriculum, they look at things like voice and uh, self-expression and a sort of a developing a sense of place, and all those are valid. What it really comes down to for Odyssey is personal empowerment. So it's getting folks who haven't, who think about their lives in one way, maybe that's overly restrictive, and getting them to change their mindset and think, I can do 
everything I see in front of me. There's nothing that's off limits because I realize I am smart enough. I have what it takes. I can be in a college classroom. I can communicate myself and, 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 and my views more effectively than I, than I could before. I can advocate for my position. I can advocate for my views. I matter. That's all of what Odyssey does. And what we found in applying that to the prison classroom is it's opening people's eyes to all kinds of things that they didn't think were possible before. That is what brings me to my third point, why I'm here and why I'm excited about what the presentations are going to be today and why I'm so excited to connect with all of you. So what we're finding is uh, comes down to a logistical issue in the Department of Corrections. We're teaching folks at a prison that's 15 minutes from Madison, Oak Hill Correctional. We're looking to expand into other prisons now through the, the UW Prison Education Initiative, but right now we're at Oak Hill. We have students like Carl here who have gone through our program. They didn't think they could make it in a college classroom. All of a sudden, they're looking around saying, oh my gosh, the world's my oyster. What do I do next? At Oak Hill, in particular, it's a minimum security prison, so folks there are generally transitioning out of the system and preparing for release. And guess what? A lot of them are coming back to Milwaukee. And we're getting calls every day now from our alumni who have gone through our program. They're in Milwaukee, and they want to, they want to know what's next. They, they caught the bug uh, it's through our program. They want to know what their next move is in terms of higher education. They want to know how it fits into their larger reentry picture. As everyone here, I'm sure, knows, folks who are reentering have a long list of things that they're trying to balance in a new environment. So how does higher education fit into that? We're interested in helping in that issue, and we want to partner with the folks in this room so that you know we're a resource for folks who come to you and are interested in higher education. I know there are other folks in, in the room here as well, like Darren Wheelock from Marquette, met with earlier today, who are also interested in helping. We want higher education to be a part of that discussion that we're having in reentry, because we, in our experience, we feel like there's an avenue for at least some folks to, to self-actualize and, and hit that moment of personal empowerment through education that is not often available to folks as an option. So we want to make sure that, that that's there on their radar and they have that available to them. I, I'm going to turn this back over to Mike uh, to, to introduce our speakers, but I wanted to say again how much I appreciate being invited here, how much I appreciate being a part of the conversation. I feel like in reentry, a lot of folks in a lot of different places sort of look at it from afar and say, oh boy, you know, I wish that they would do this better or wish that uh, we could improve this kind of delivery. I think it's all up to all of us to roll up our sleeves and say, what can I do? What can my organization do to help this issue? Because I think it's, it's an issue for all of us, uh, and I think to the extent we can work together and find ways to collaborate for the folks we serve, overall, we're going to be in a much better position. So thank you again for the opportunity. That was great, Peter. Thank you. I loved everything I heard. Um, so speaking about uh, what's next, um, you know, uh, we asked that question uh, ourselves about five years ago at the Badger Institute in a similar context. Really, really what we do is we try to identify obstacles to success, and then we go out and we try to find the smartest people in the country uh, to help us remove those obstacles. So about five years ago, I asked Bob Woodson, who's the founder of what's now known as the Woodson uh, Center out in D.C., uh, who in this country knows the most about reentry, and who has the best track record? Who's not just talking about it, who's doing it? Best track record in the country, who's actually doing it in a way that makes a difference? And no hesitation from Bob, John Ponder. John Ponder is the guy in, in, in the entire country that if you really want to know uh, how to do reentry, because uh, John's been there in so many ways, you should talk to him. So initially, we just did a profile on John at the Badger Institute, um, including a special report uh, here that we did called Unlocking Potential. Uh, you might not recognize John. He actually looks younger somehow than he did in this one. This was five years ago. I'm not sure how that happened, but um, John's story is, is inspirational, and it's really, it's pretty amazing. Uh, John was a bank robber. In 2005, he pleaded guilty, spent years in prison. Uh, in prison, John found a Bible, and he found a purpose. 
After being released, he started Hope for Prisoners, which is, as many of you know by now, a nonprofit that helps provide job training, mentorship, and counseling, but also other essentials, an emphasis on faith, and now education as a way to help men and women reconnect with their families and with their communities to find jobs and, and stability. So what you're going to hear today doesn't need to be just another forgotten speech. I guess that's my main message. It's not just words. What John has done can be done here in Milwaukee. We brought John in one other time several years ago. People listened, acted, and today, thanks to Nick Ringer, I don't see, I thought Nick was gonna be here. Maybe he's watching remotely. Uh, we have Partners in Hope at Community Warehouse right here in Milwaukee, very similar to, are you here, Nick? Adam's here. Oh, Adam's here, okay. Uh, very similar to what John has done in Las Vegas. Um, so after John speaks, he's going to introduce the folks who in Vegas have been a part of these endeavors out in Nevada, Dr. James McCoy and, and, and Graham Miller, and I'm missing somebody. But... Um, and after their discussion, we'll take questions again for a few minutes. Uh, you might know, by the way, just one other quick thing, that one year ago, next Tuesday, John was pardoned by the President of the United States. It was said that day that John's story uplifts the soul, inspires action, and unites us all as one nation under God. I believe that. I know John well, and I think you will too after you hear what John has to say. John, thanks for joining us. John Ponder. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And Mike, thank you for that introduction. I don't even need to tell my story now. The gentleman from the Odyssey School, man, thank you so very much for what it is that you're doing. Uh, it's just indeed refreshing to know that there are people out there that are putting in the work that you're putting in and understanding the importance of uh, education um, for men and women who are uh, formerly incarcerated. If you were to ask anybody, who has ever achieved any significant level of success in life, how did you get there? If they're completely honest with you, you're gonna admit that they did not get there on their own, and we don't understand if you would improve the caliber of how you're gonna live the rest of your life, education has to be a huge component of that. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. Uh, while preparing for today, I you know, came across some, uh, some studies, and I'm not a guy who, who follows notes. I'm all over the place. I'm not a guy who can follow a PowerPoint presentation because I'll be all over the place. And I'm not really a guy who could stand behind a, a, a pulpit, so to speak, without preaching. So when I get done with this, I'm gonna have to move because if not, I'm gonna drop a sermon in this room and then ask for an offering afterwards. <laughs> But when we talk about education, if you, you think about the things that are taking place in our country and the conversations that uh, have, and I was very excited to know that uh, there's going to be an introduction of the, of the Pell Grants that are, uh, that are coming back, and I'm very, very excited about that. You know, the second chance Pell experiment in 2015 was providing Pell Grants to incarcerated students in up to 67 programs through post-secondary education in state and federal prisons. The program was expanded in 2020 to allow up to 67 additional programs to participate. And since 2015, over 22,000 unique participants have enrolled in Second Chance Pell programs across the states uh, in the, in the uh, federal prison system. In December 2020, the lawmakers expanded access to Pell Grants once again to include students who are incarcerated uh, as long as they were enrolled in prison education programs that were approved by state or uh, federal prison system and that they met all of the requirements. Uh, the, this expansion of the Second Chance Pell experiment will allow opportunities for students uh, to apply the best practices in implementing and reinstating the Pell Grant eligibility for incarcerated students and will expand the geographic range of, of the programs with the goals of including the programs in most of or all 50 states. Education plays a crucial role in people's ability to prosper and to advance. All too often, Justice-impacted individuals are left out of the higher education landscape. 
even for those who are serving lengthy or even life sentences, prison education has a profound and uh, often life-changing benefit. There's a substantial reduction in violence and disciplinary infractions among those who are involved in prison education. The impact of education goes well beyond the walls of the prisons themselves, to your point, extending into their homes, uh, into the communities of the incarcerated students. Studies show, for instance, that post-secondary prison education has, uh, has many positive effects on the children who, uh, who are of the incarcerated, offering them a chance to break the intergenerational cycle of inequity and incarceration. And throughout our prison system, close to six out of 10 incarcerated persons do not attain a higher level education during their, out of, uh, during their incarceration. Out of those who do, the most common program completed is a high school equivalent or a GED. Only 9% of those people in prison were able to successfully finish a post-secondary education while incarcerated. 2% of those completed an associate's degree and 7% received a certificate from a college or trade school. By providing education in prison, it's, it's proven to reduce recidivism rates and is associated with higher employment opportunities for those who are returning to our community, which will impact and improve public safety. So that as the men and women are returning back to our community, they can be productive, law-abiding members of our community. So by way of introduction, my name is John Ponder. I'm the founder and CEO of Hope for Prisoners. And what Hope for Prisoners does is we work with men, women, and young adults that are exiting different arenas of our judicial system. So we work with folks who are coming home from state or federal prisons, city, county jails, drug rehabs, halfway houses, transitional facilities, and the likes. And what we do is provide the supportive services to help the men and women that are coming home not only get acclimated back into workplaces, but we make sure there's mechanisms in place through partnerships that we built up with employers that once they get inside these workplaces, they're gonna be afforded every opportunity to thrive and be able to grow and afforded every opportunity to succeed. We address the needs for them to get acclimated back into their family, which has been a missed mark and reentry since forever. It's like no one's ever given the particular close attention that is needed for the men and women that are returning back to our community. They have to get reconnected with wives and, and husbands and, and particularly get reconnected with their children. So we work to make sure that there's a, a mechanism in place to help with the family reuni reunification component because everybody in this room can attest to the fact if, if the home life is not right, if the family life is not right, then everything else in the world has a tendency to fall apart. And then on the back end of the process, because there's a long-term 18-month journey where we walk with them, we wanna do everything we possibly can to ensure that we're helping them to be stand-up leaders in the community with an overall goal of never, ever, ever reoffending again. So as Mike had indicated, Hope for Prison was birthed out of my own personal experiences. I was a guy who was coming in and out of the system since I was you know, 12 years old, in and out of different jails and prisons. And, and one day I stood in the prison cell, I had a conversation with God and asked God to step in and turn my life around. And 100% he did. And when my life went in that 180 degree turn, the mantle that has been placed in my life is to turn right back around and help other men and women who were facing those same challenges that I once had to face to do everything I can to remove the barriers that are preventing them from being successful in life and to help to escort them up to the next level of life. So Hope for Prisons was found back in 2009 when I came home from prison. And since that time, we've had the great privilege of working with over 4,000 men and women have been through our process. Of those 4,000 men and women we had the great privilege to work with, an unprecedented 74% of those individuals were successful in gaining full-time employment in sustainable wage jobs. 25% of those individuals were, were plugged in with sustainable wage jobs within 17 days after graduation. And of those individuals we had the privilege to work with, according to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, who stepped in and wanted to see how good we were doing, what they determined 
was that only 6% of those individuals went back to the prison system. It is a number that we are very proud of, but we're not satisfied <laughs> because our desire is not to lose anybody. Our desire is to do everything we can with every resource that we have available to us to come alongside these individuals and help them to successfully reintegrate back into our community. So how do we do it? How do we get that level of success? Well, everything that we do, it starts with an 18 month process before they even get released. Right now in the state of Nevada, we are in seven institutions in the state of Nevada to where we go in and begin to work with them. You know that old cliche, reentry needs to begin at day one, right? It needs to begin whether you're doing five years or 10 years or whether you're doing two, you need to come alongside individuals to, to, to make sure that they're able to spend every waking moment of their time Number one, addressing the issues surrounding the circumstances that led to their incarceration, and then be able to come alongside them to prepare them for the day that they walk outside that door. And that's what it is that we do. Not only do we go in and provide vocational training inside the prison system, not only do we go in and, divide, and, 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 and provide leadership training, substance abuse uh, issues, so they can have an opportunity to address those things, we want to make sure that we're private emotional wellness and, and addressing the trauma. But we also want to make sure that we're bringing educational opportunities for them while they're inside the system. The uniqueness in what it is that we do is that once they're released from the prison system, they're not just released into the community by themselves. For years we have done that, for decades we have done that, provided services inside the prison system, and the minute they walk out of R&D, they're launched out into the community by themselves, we have wasted time, effort, energies, and resources. The uniqueness in what it is that we do is we stay with them for 18 months in a mechanism. So there's 18 months before, there's 18 months after, where we provide a continuum of care. That, that training program uh, stuff could not stop the minute they walk out. But I want you to imagine, if you will, all those things that I just discussed taking place on the inside, the educational opportunities. How about this one, the substance abuse, right? For, for years in prison, we've been providing NAAA and all these good things but if we launch them out in the community by themselves back in the same neighborhood, guess what it is is gonna happen? They can go right back to that same thing, but as we're going into the prison system, developing relationships with the men and women so that the, the first people that they wanna see when they walk outside that door is the people that they have developed the relationships with so we can have that continuum of care. You don't have to start all over with your substance abuse treatment, there is a counseling team that are gonna be there to walk with you. You don't have to start over with your educational opportunities because we have case managers and mentors that are gonna help do a warm handoff right back to the college campus so there could be a continuum of care. We do that through intensive case management and we do that through mentoring, where in our Las Vegas community we have trained up well over 500 men and women that serve as mentors. Now these mentors are pastors and leaders from churches across Southern Nevada. These are leaders in other houses of faith. These are school teachers from our school district. These are professors from our university, right down to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Now watch me smile when I say this. <laughs> to where our local sheriff has given us an army of volunteer police officers that serve as mentors. I think the last count was 135. Never before in the history of reentry, nowhere on this planet, to this magnitude, has law enforcement gotten this involved in mentoring and training formerly incarcerated people coming back to the community. And that level of partnership has caused such a win-win on both sides of the equation. Because if you think about it, our goal is to get men and women to come home from the prison system, get out in the community, never reoffend again. In order for us to be able to do that, it starts on the inside with that character change. We have to develop in them a love, 
respect and appreciation for the rules and regulations out in the community. We found that something very magical happened when we brought them into relationship with the men and women who uphold the law. And if you flip the coin around to the other side, the tremendous benefit is that this is forcing law enforcement to view people coming home from the prison system who are truly fighting for a second chance to view them from a whole nother set of lenses. Our, our, our goal is to get them back out in the community, uh, get them gainfully employed. The training that we have provided and the educational opportunities we have provided inside the prison system and being able to partner with them, uh, partner them with our partner and employers, and they're not minimum wage jobs. <laughs> The jobs where people are earning sustainable wages, where number one, they're able to take care of themselves and be able to take care of their family. We could not do that with the unprecedented partnerships that we built up. And whenever I travel around the country in settings like this, they always ask you, how you do it? How do you, how do you build that up? And people say you're the number one reentry program in the country. How do you do it? I say to them that we cannot do that with the, without the unprecedented partnerships that we built up with people in the community. I talked about law enforcement. You have to have a partnership with the Department of Corrections. If Department of Corrections is not fully vested and fully on board, it's not gonna work. You gotta have a, a, a partnership with parole and probation. If you don't have your parole officers at the table with the case management, you're pulling the person in two different directions. One of the other things that, that we found in our partnership with Correction, this is why I'm so grateful that Adam Purcell and the great work that you're doing out here in Milwaukee, man, you are by far my hero to be able to have people who have been there and done that go into the prison system and be able to provide that training. It's those educational opportunities that um, that's going to lead to folks being successful. It gives me an honor and a privilege to uh, introduce to you some people that we uh, uh, brought along with us. So you won't think that John Parnes is just a talking head up here. You know, from that partnership that we built up with the College of Southern Nevada, um, it has grown and exploded over the years. Uh, so from the College of Southern Nevada, I uh, brought along with me uh, Dr. James McCoy, so you can have an opportunity to hear directly from him. Also in attendance with me today is Mr. Graham Miller. Mr. Graham Miller has spent over 17 years inside the penitentiary, was introduced to educational opportunities while he was incarcerated inside Nevada Department of Corrections. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to, for him to hear directly from him what it is that he's doing today as a direct result of prison education. And in addition to that, I brought my other colleague, Dr. Carolyn Willis, who is a programs manager on staff at Hope for Prisons, but uh, when Graham was released, she was his case manager. And I would love for her to be able to share the conversation that she had with Mr. Miller stressing the importance of the education. So if it's all right with you, I'd like to invite you guys on up to have this conversation. I just wanted to reiterate that as you're having the conversation that folks in the audience should text their questions as well because half of the audience is remote. It's going to be easier if we commingle the questions and then if I can read them. Otherwise, the people asking the questions won't be captured on video. So instead of standing up at the end, if you could just text questions, you can start anytime. I will, uh, I'll read them off the, off the iPad. So thanks, John. Okay. So uh, Dr. McCoy, perhaps maybe uh, you could start off and share 
uh, first of all, tell everybody who it is and, and uh, tell them about the work that we're doing and the position that the College of Southern Nevada has taken on prison education uh, and what it may be even what it looks like moving forward. You bet. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is James McCoy. I serve as the Chief Academic Officer for the College of Southern Nevada. It's a small little college in the desert of Southern Nevada. We service about 36,000 students uh, every semester. And one of the things that I want to just give praise to right now, Mr. Ponder, to Mr. Ponder, is this man is visionary. When we talk about meeting students where they are, right? We talk about open access to higher education, equitable access to higher education. No matter who their mama is, who their daddy is, where they've come from, what crime they've committed, it's about creating that pathway to greater prosperity. We often talk, Mr. Ponder, right about higher education being the great equalizer no matter what. And so when John came to us, when our legislature was about to meet in a biennium session in 2017, and we kind of put our heads together, and he says, I've got this thing called Hope for Prisoners, and we would like to partner with a higher education institution to provide that propensity for growth inside and outside those cell walls. And we looked at each other, I kind of looked at him, and I said, bipartisan? Prison reform? Reentry reform in Nevada? Okay. If you're in, we're in. And then he brought the community in. And I can't tell you how many times we sat in those, in those uh, benches, in those hearing rooms as this 2017 Nevada legislature was meeting. And that, but by the end of that 2017 legislation session, it was unanimous support, Senator, unanimous support for this kind of reform. And so they provided some seed money to the College of Southern Nevada to take College of Southern Nevada and create a campus, if you will, on the inside of a men's prison and on the inside of a women's prison. And we brought our faculty, and we brought our staff, and we showed up. And we created a program in that two-year pilot experience uh, that wasn't just about offering a course it wasn't just about paralleling what was going on in programming through Hope for Prisoners, through substance abuse reform, uh, and English 101. It was about comprehensive care. And going back to what we refer to in the Nevada system of higher education as meeting students where they are. We met them where they were. We created that pathway. So I want for just a moment, I'm having a hard time sitting here. I just need to stand for just 10 seconds. Uh, I want you to for imagine right now you are in cell block C at High Desert State Prison. Put yourself there. See it? You've seen this in the movies. Maybe you've experienced this in the local uh, reform center. The inmates trail in. They're gathered in rows just like this. It's their first day, their first exposure to college. And they sit in uniform fashion in parallel, just like this. And I have the blessed opportunity to join Mr. Ponder. And we sit and we, we, we introduce ourselves and go something like this. Ladies and gentlemen, in this case, ladies or gentlemen, depending on which group we're talking with. My name is James McCoy. I serve as the chief academic officer. And I serve as a professor at the College of Southern Nevada. This is your college, 20 miles up that road. I want to welcome you to your first day as a college student. And I pause. And I wait for the reaction. And some, some of the young men, some of the young women kind of just stare at me stone-faced like, is this for real? We've heard promises before. Others are staring at you thinking, oh my goodness, this could be the, this could be the next chapter of my life that I've always prayed for. And then there's this moment. And John, I know you know this well, and Graham, I know you remember this. <laughs> Where we say, today, we brought a team of people. Behind me, we've got the senior brass of the Nevada Department of Corrections. We've got employers. We've got apprenticeship leaders. We've got union labor trade uh, leaders. We've got the president of the college. We've got the faculty who are going to bring you along. We've got case managers from Hope for Prisoners who are here for you. We've got financial aid people, counselors, tutors. We've got, we brought the community. We're meeting you where you are. And today, you're going to trade in that Nevada Department of Corrections number for a Nevada System of Higher Education number. Today's the day that you will remember moving forward as the first day of the rest of your life. 
And it's that tone set that we do on that first day where we bring the community, we meet our students where they are in that moment, and we set the expectations. This is not just about taking Composition 101 or preparing for OSHA in certification and trade and vocational readiness. This is about creating a cadre or a cohort of learners and in higher education, you know, we call that learning communities. And you're going to do this journey together. And in one short year from now, when you've completed that 100 hours of pre-apprenticeship training, when you've completed those college credits and they're transcripted, not with an asterisk on the transcript saying you took those at the, at the uh, correctional facility, but a real college transcript, we're all going to come back. And we're going to bring the governor with us. And we're going to celebrate you on your graduation day. Then you're going to release. And you're going to make two phone calls on that day. And I love saying this next part, friends. The first call you're going to make, no doubt, is to someone who cares about you and you care about. That's fine. We'll give you that. And then immediately when you hang up that call, the second call you're going to make is to who, John? Hope for prisoners. That's the recipe. That's the secret sauce. I can't expect them to walk out of High Desert State Prison down that long corridor out to the public street and be expected to walk back into my doors of the College of Southern Nevada. There's too many, too many complications and road bumps along the way. I need them to connect with Carolyn at Hope for Prisoners, who is then going to do exactly what Mr. Ponder said. It's going to create that wraparound, not create, continue the wraparound support structure that they have experienced on the inside and get them reoriented and plugged back in, not as a new student now at the College of Southern Nevada, but as a continuing student at the College of Southern Nevada. So I'm going to pause there, John, so we can hear the great stories of Graham. Absolutely. Thank you so very, very much for that. Uh, so please allow me to introduce you to uh, Mr. Graham Miller. Uh, Graham Miller uh, did 17 years in prison. We've had the great privilege to work with him in the model that Mr. Dr. McCoy just explained. And then, Graham, perhaps maybe you can tell them about what your view of uh, education was, uh, how Dr. Willis changed that mindset, and tell everybody what it is that you're doing today. Thank you for the introduction, John, Dr. McCoy. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. And uh, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I, 15 felony convictions. Uh, my last sentence was four or five to 20 year sentences. I was classified as a habitual criminal. And during the course of my prison stay, I did prison. And that, I was introduced to Hope for Prisoners and I didn't take it serious. I knew people who were doing it. And I heard about, oh, they can do a job. You know, you can pursue higher education and you know, so I entertain the idea. And that's exactly what it was at that time, an idea. Because, you know, getting in and out of prison, people don't have that support. People don't pursue the higher education. Some people aren't informed as to what it can do for you. And given that opportunity, I sat down with Dr. Willis. And she presented me with the idea of going to college. And said, hey, what do you want to do when you get home? And, for me, it was like college, nope, not doing it, not my thing. I'm not good at math, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not part of my plan. And fast forward to she gave me some ideas. I like what I heard. And she let me know how pursuing higher education can assist me with getting my children back, coming home from prison, obtaining a career, um, opening a business, actually having people work for me. And I said, okay, you know what? Hey, let's sign up, let's do it, you know? I'll entertain the idea. And from that point, she laid a plan out. She said, this is what we're gonna do and this is how we're gonna do it. From that point, I said, okay, you know, you want me to go to school, you want me to take these college courses? She said, hey, pick a major, what do you wanna do? I said, okay, well, you know, I want to work on ACs. I want to do air conditioning. I want to do refrigeration. Can you do that for me? So, you know, pulling up stuff online and pursuing a degree program. And at this time, I'm still incarcerated. I'm like, Shh, I'm going to come home from prison. I'm going to go to school while I'm in prison. 
and I'm going to obtain a career, get actual certifications. No way. Not me. You know, I'm a habitual criminal. Nobody's going to give me a job. I'm going to go to school and I'm going to get out and it's going to be for nothing. Um, and I was wrong. You know, uh, she laid the plan out for me. I stuck to the plan. We signed up for school. At this time, I'm still programming in prison. I'm having to deal with the lockdowns and, and you know, just prison life, but still pursuing the higher education. From that point, I was transferred to a facility that allowed me to pursue it even more, that allowed me to get a job, still incarcerated, Nevada Department of Corrections. And I did it. I took the leap. I signed up for school, start taking courses. While at this time, I was able to obtain a job at Hope for Prisoners, part of an employer station casinos, which has multiple properties in Las Vegas. And at the time, I got hired as a dishwasher. I told the guy, I said, hey, man, I'm going to school, too. I want to get into your engineering department. He said, yeah, okay, if you make it that far, I'll help you get there. Worked hard. CSN was flexible. They allowed me to go to school. I went to work. I caught the bus, took programs, and still dealt with everyday prison life. And it wasn't easy. So fast forward to me washing dishes, position opens in engineering. I harass the engineers every day. Hey, I want to get in your department. They're like, nah. Some of them are like, well, when the position opens, apply. And I found the boss, the director of that department, and I laid my situation out to him. I'm going to school. I'm going to work. I'm still incarcerated at this time. I'm in prison. Basically, pursuing that higher education has allowed me to become a father. I have full custody of my kids. I am a general engineer at a major casino that has over 15 properties in Las Vegas, Nevada. I have master keys to the entire property, and I can walk into the soft count room where all the money's at. Basically, pursuing this higher education has allowed me to live my life on my terms. I'm currently still enrolled in school. I am pursuing my degree. I changed it to the industrial side due to my experience, and I'll be obtaining my degree next year at the end of it. Air conditioning technology and food service refrigeration slash central plant. John Ponder, Hope for Prisoners, College of Southern Nevada, and Miss Carolyn Willis, Dr. Carolyn Willis, has allowed me to, the day I got released from prison, I bought a vehicle, went and got a place to live, took parenting classes, I have custody of my children, I'm soon to be married, and I've been promoted to a relief management position, which in turn is going to turn into a management position. Mm. And that's what I'm doing today, and that's what my feelings are on higher education. The thing that really, really hurts the narrative of formerly incarcerated people is, is the people that, because it happens, people come home from prison and, you know, they, they've been out, you know, they've done six, seven, eight years, um, and, you know, they come home, and within six months, they done did something stupid, and they, they re, re it, they're going back to prison. That hits the six o'clock news as the formerly incarcerated people, person who re -offended. That hits the six o'clock news, but, but not too often do you hear the tremendous stories of people like Graham. The people who have been out 10, 15, 20 years, and, and not only have they not gone back, but they're living phenomenal lives. And the more we have an opportunity to push those stories out, this is when the naysayers will change their mind. But the partnerships with the employers, understanding that they are, they can be tremendous assets. And there was one other misconception, I'm gonna shut up because I can just keep going. People have done significant amount of times and may have been arrested for a homicide and done 15, 20 years. There's this, this, there's this stigma about hiring people like that, right? But those are the most successful people in existence. Those are the people who come home because while they're in prison, they got this mindset, well, nobody's gonna give me a chance. But when I, we train them, 
through CSM, they get these certifications, and then that, that employer who pays them that sustainable wage and starts them at $31, $32 an hour, that person will be the most loyal person in this company performing better than someone who has never been locked up before. Yeah, this is a kind of a follow-up, but I think for Graham, I, and also a follow-up to some of the things that you had to say, um, it's a question about how you come to believe in yourself. You know, how do you work to help incarcerated folks see themselves as students uh, when the opportunity is given, uh, they can see themselves as someone who can do it. Um, most of this work is overcoming the dehumanizing aspect of incarceration, which makes people see themselves as incapable of pursuing higher ed. Maybe I just wonder if you could follow up a little bit more on how you came to believe that you could you could do this and have, I guess, what the academics call agency, right? Like you could make yes. it, do it yourself. So for me, it was about having that support system. You know, you have a support system. It's not only about believing in yourself, you know. When you, ha when you have people who are willing to stand in your corner and they're genuine about what they say and what they do, I mean, how often in life are us as human beings just told what we want to hear? People tell you what you want to hear just to maybe shut you up, get you out the way, or move on. When you have people that are genuine, willing to help you and assist you, not giving you the keys, but giving you the roadmap to how to get the keys, you know, it makes you believe in yourself a lot more, you know. And having that, when you start to see the results of the work you're doing, when I start going to school and I start seeing the results of me going to school and pursuing a higher education and sticking to the plan, it's you, you lose all doubt that you had in yourself, at least for me. I lost that. There's nothing I can't do today. There's people at my job. I started out washing dishes, and within two years, more than doubled my salary, um, all because of what somebody else said I couldn't do as a formerly incarcerated person. Um, and then just the ability and the will to want more out of life. You know, you want more out of life. You're tired of being locked up. You're tired of sitting in the walls. And I had kids, a family. I wanted to build a family. I wanted to come home and not have to worry about how I'm going to feed my kids, not how I'm going to feed myself. Uh, you know, so the support system from Hope for Prisoners and CSN working with me and being flexible and understanding I had a full-time job, understanding that, hey, I have to catch the bus. Sometimes I'm going to be late to school. I'm going to get off school and have to attend a five-hour class after just working graveyard. I'm going to be tired in class. And my professor was more than willing to work with me and understood that. Hmm. So that gave me all doubt went out the window. It's a wrap. I'm doing everything I want to do today plus more. You know. So when people have that support, that's going to help them move forward. I would like to add something as well. Uh, like Graham said, uh, one of the things as a practitioner that I found uh, in giving people back the confidence that they need to know that they can accomplish anything is to see them as a human being. A lot of times during incarceration, you lose your identity as a person, as, as a father, as a mother, as a member of the community that you need to return to. And often it's the unspoken things that uh, someone that has been formerly incarcerated that they don't say. You know, the emotional aspect that you don't want to talk about because you've been to prison and you should come home and you should be tough. And it's breaking down those barriers and letting them know that the person that's sitting on the other side of the desk, we do understand. We do want to see them succeed. We want to touch all those things and remove those barriers because sometimes the barriers aren't physical they're literally emotional they can be mental and those are the things that we need to be able to tap into to let individuals as they come home to their community know that they belong know that they are a part of the community they're not the sum of what they were accused of or sentenced for and once we're able to do that, it literally motivates them because the sense of belonging, that social bond that you need to have to be a part of something, if you're able to tap into that, you tap into their humanness and you let them know, we see you as a human being. We don't see you as what you're labeled as. 
So I think that is a huge factor and that's what our organization prides ourselves in. There is no judgment. Whenever we meet with someone, it doesn't matter what your background is, the fact that you're there, I always tell clients, I don't care what you did yesterday. Today you're here telling me you need help. What matters is what you do moving forward from today. So John Ponder has a famous saying, I had to conquer the enemy on the inner me. <laughs> you know, so you conquer the enemy on the inner me, then you'll have no problem moving forward. That was great. Thank you. Uh, I think this one might be for Dr. McCoy or maybe for John. I'm combining a couple of questions here. It's basically about funding. What, where does your funding come from? What percentage comes from where? Another person who sent a, a query in. Uh, is of the opinion there's just not enough legislative funding? Is that where money has to come from? Are there other sources? So. I'm going to let uh, Dr. McCoy take the first. I'll take the back. Well, sure. I'll, I'll start on the educational piece. No doubt what uh, Mr. Ponder was talking about earlier today related to Second Chance Pell. Federal reform uh, in the Pell Grant space with the ability to benefit is absolutely essential to move this forward to scale. Thank you, Senator. Pause that there because when we talk about the ability to benefit and the reform work that happens on the inside with these kinds of secret sauce recipes, if we don't create the opportunities, and Second Chance Pell has proved this, right? I mean, we, we've seen this. We've seen this across the states. In these institutions that have Second Chance Pell, the propensity for the ability to benefit to continue on the outside of prison post-release only continues. So that kind of federal investment is important. Now, I know we've got to prove that, and we have proved that through our data. And so when we talk about the opportunity, not just for a second chance Pell, but for just in perpetuity Pell, just Pell. It's not second chance anymore. They're out. We're done. It's, it's just Pell. Right. I think that's going to be really the secret sauce. Now, in the meantime, uh, our state, in the great state of Nevada, uh, has put some seed money into this. To let us prove our case. And so we scholarship 100% of our students that are in uh, the CSN Hope for Prisoners Prison Education Program while they're on the inside. And then we scholarship these students when they get out until they can get the financial aid that they need to support them and their families through this experience. And Graham's right. A lot of, these, a lot of the times we don't want to just write that check, blank, 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 check, blank check, just like with all, excuse me, all of our students. We want to make sure that they get a little, you know, get a little uh, you know, money in the game, right? Put a little bit of that, that engineering paycheck into the game. Put that skin into the game. I think just like for all of our students, uh, we create that opportunity. And for Hope? Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, Dr. McCoy answered those questions. And, you know, a lot of our funding, yes, we do get uh, uh, Department of Justice money. We get Department of Labor uh, funding, but that's not what it, how we started out, out, how we started out it, because we didn't have big track records and things of that nature. You know, uh, 10 years ago, we started out with, you know, with a dream and everything that we built up had come off of personal and private donations, right? People believing in the mission. And that was just the fuel to get us running so we can get our feet underneath us so we can build up that track record. And now we're in a position where we pick and choose whether or not this Department of Labor grant is going to fit what it is that we're doing or this Department of Justice or, or whether the kind of state funding is going to, uh, you know, be able to climb into the vein of what it is that we're doing to, to proving uh, the success, right, and making sure that we're not just grabbing funding, mission creeping. i got to say one more thing. This doesn't get said enough. It is cheaper to educate than it is to welcome these students back inside prison. Right? It's cheap. Pay now or pay later. I'd rather pay now and create productive members of society and neighbors by which I will have barbecues and volleyball camp with, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And, and secondarily to that, the students on the inside, and this is fascinating data, by the way. This is four years of, of longitudinal data in terms of six college success now. The average course completion rate for Graham and his colleagues the average persistence rate term to term post uh, release as well, and the average program completion rate is higher than the average college wide completion, persistence, and course completion rate that we see. I mean, just put, the, turns out these folks have a lot of time on their hands. And when you wrap around them with the support and the structure that they need to succeed, they will succeed. It's incredible. Pay now or pay later. In, 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 in Southern Nevada, in, in the two institutions that we started this in, 90% of the, 
of the incarcerated were going to be coming home. They're coming home anyway. We ought to create that pathway for success immediately. Pay now or pay later. I like that. Absolutely. And if, if I just made the, the, the odyssey, and again, thank you so much for what it is that you're doing, right? Uh, and and uh, Dr. McCoy just made me think about this. One of the problems that we have had <clears throat> in the judicial system, in prison system, and again, I'm telling you from personal experience, <clears throat> is that the infrastructure of a prison system creates habits that are the exact opposite of successful reentry. In other words, the day-to-day -day activities inside a prison system can create habits that are the exact opposite of successful reentry. In other words, <clears throat> I'm not trying to hit nobody in the mouth, but if we think about this, yeah. But if we, if we think about this, if a person is able to get, is allowed to get up every morning because of the infrastructure of a prison system, they get up every morning and they're able to do this particular routine every single day, three or four times a day over the course of a 10 year period and it wasn't healthy, it's gonna be impossible for that person to successfully re-enter back into the community. But when we can take our prison systems and factor in that we understand that we, we have to be safe, but create an environment to where people are going to be able to learn and to grow and to thrive, much like what Odyssey is doing, create this incubator for change, I believe that that is what is going to change the culture of prison systems because it's proven that prison education Reduce violence. Prison education reduce. You give them more equitable things to be able to do instead of sitting down, watching TV, or playing cards. The infrastructure of a prison system is going to create a habit. If we have an opportunity to choose those habits, think about the tremendous benefit it's going to be like on the, on the back end of the door. We will see people released from prison systems, and it's, it's going to be phenomenal in the community. I don't know why there are not more vocational training opportunities inside the prison systems. I don't care what prison that you're in, right? Because if you think about it, it by doing that, and, and just like Mr. Coy said, some people say we can't, we can't, we can't afford it. What is it costing us not to do it? But when we create these opportunities for them to learn and be able to tie that directly with employment where they take care of themselves and take care of the family, and the reason why the entire community should get involved with this is because you're taking men and women who were former wards of the state, a, a burden to the taxpayer, and now they're earning these sustainable wages they're paying taxes, and they become fuel in the economic engine of our community. What is it costing us not to do that? A follow-up question, I think, for Dr. Willis. I'll combine a couple. What are the degree options that you provide to those inside? Is it just general ed credits? Um, what is it? And then a related question. Um, how do you address the issue of having a great program at one facility, uh, you know, can you replicate that elsewhere uh, at multiple sites? And are there security classifications in some places that prohibit you from having programs that are available elsewhere? So a lot of questions combined for you. OK, uh, with reference to the security aspect, uh, we work with uh, the institutions. And they are, depending on their classification systems, it's not an issue if we have individuals that are in protective custody or higher custody levels, then those individuals just do classes as a cohort. And then the general, uh, the general population. classification, yeah, they do the population, they do uh, classes as a different cohort. So the cohorts are separated based on uh, custody level. Uh, when it comes to classes that are inside the institution, it depends on which institution it, it is in. So we do have general ed uh, courses, and maybe Mr. McCoy can speak more on that as well. But we do have a, the apprenticeship route as well. And if they are in, uh, depending on the NDOC facility, they can also do general classes, 
basically looking at whatever degree they want to pursue, and then they can pursue that degree. So it is different, and I, I think it's, uh, it dif it's different depending on the institution, but it's a wide variety that they can pursue. Uh, when it comes to replication, uh, we do replicate in other institutions. One of the things uh, that we do at Hope for Prisoners, we are big on policies and procedures, so, and we do a lot of evaluations when it comes to the programs that we're working with. So in, in, when we do our evaluations, we're able to see what works and utilize the what works approach, and uh, we're able to replicate easily or easier. Are there more questions, or I can? There, there are. Yeah, but go, go ahead. Go ahead. We got we got a bunch more, but go ahead. Uh, Twenty seconds. We want again going back to what I was mentioning earlier. Meeting students where they are. Right. We don't want to give them a cookie cutter and say fit one of these boxes. We want to make sure, to Graham's point, that the 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 passion, the experience, the vision for their own lives and their own careers is going to be met. And so when, we, when this intake kind of experience happens, no doubt there's general education courses that are going to be applicable to everybody, right? And that's there. Uh, but when we talk about the opportunity then for trades, for example, the vocations, the apprenticeships, the unions, the employment that comes along with that, those are kind of created uh, as, a, as, a, as each student needs them. And I just want to say real quickly on scale, um, that, that two-year legislated pilot in 2017 is about a $300,000 investment is all it was, pennies in terms of a state uh, 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 expenditure. Uh, but what it proved over those two years is that scalability opportunity, as any good pilot should do, right? And so what then, then in the next legislative session, that $300,000 was a million-dollar line item. And then we were able to bring this to replica, replicability to northern Nevada, a Western Nevada College and a Truckee Meadows Community College. So three, three of the higher ed institutions now in the state from that one bit of seed money. A question about do you work with the apprenticeship process to help people with that route if a college degree is not best for them for whatever reason? That's the name of the game. In fact, when we first got started, we anticipated about 50% of the, st of the students were going to pursue sort of a traditional college degree kind of experience, right? General ed, liberal arts, med school, law school, whatever they were going, right? But, but and we, we found that to be the case the first year. But after that first year, as we really began to listen to what the vision our students had for their own lives, we realized that probably 75 to 80%, depending on the cohort, were destined for a specific apprenticeship experience with a very specific union connection point. And once we opened our eyes to that and realized what that opportunity meant, when we can bring the unions in as employers at the front end through partnerships that John and Carolyn were talking about, that, sh that was a game changer. You know, we just built a Raiders stadium. You hear about this in Las Vegas? We just built a Raiders stadium. Said the first Monday night football game two nights ago, right? <laughs> we, had, we had students that were at Casa Correctional Center building that Raider Stadium as part of an apprenticeship experience paid for by the labor unions. Now, if that doesn't speak to economic sustainability and growth when we get our unions involved, I don't know what does. That was a heck of a victory yeah. for you guys really at the Raiders game. It's the, it's the training, um, and again, I, I used those two words. On the, it's the unprecedented partnerships, right? You have to identify those uh, partnerships. In, in this case that uh, um, Dr. McCoy is talking about, uh, you know, we partnered with the local 872, was the labor's union, right? So we, we, we went and shared the idea with them, the vision with them. They had some folks that were foremen that were you looking to retire and, and wanted to come in and train our folks to get them, you know, pre apprentice it was a pre apprenticeship program so that when they get released they can go into the apprenticeship program. And when I tell you that they were building the Raiders Stadium and some of those guys was making forty five dollars an hour working sixty, seventy hours per week. 
But again, that kind of money is really good money. Those other partners that you need to bring in, so we partner with J.P. Morgan Private Bank so they can come in and teach them that financial literacy so that when we're getting them these really good jobs, what they think is a blessing six months down the line is not going to be a curse to them because they have that financial literacy. So it's got to be a holistic approach, uh, bringing those collaborating partners to the table that are willing to um, you know, help put in the work. Just a couple quick ones. One more for Graham. This is a paraphrase. One of the questions was, do, do you think vocational training should start in high school? But let me paraphrase that and just say, is it ever too late? Absolutely. Vocational or, or gen ed or whatever? Absolutely not. Um, you know, for me, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. So, and I wasn't upon the time of my release. And I wouldn't have thought that at this point in my life, it would have taken me 40 something years to be able to get ready to buy a home, have a couple vehicles, have custody of my kids. A vocational program is important at any stage in life when you're ready to make that move. You know, you can be 50. There's a gentleman that just came into our apprenticeship program in Station Casinos as a junior engineer, and he's 58 years old um, just because that's a career he wanted to pursue. So it's never too late. It's never too late. Thank you. Hey, John, we've got about two more minutes for a question that I think is for you. What's really unique here is the transition process. There are a lot of places in America that have some education programs, probably not as good as the ones that you offer. But the real key, it seems to me, is how do we, how do we transition people that are getting education you know, back into the community, back into jobs? What are the major challenges, John, in, 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 in achieving that? And what do we have to overcome to get to where, to where you are? Right, so um, we can probably stay here and it'll go more than two minutes, but we, we know and understand that there are several things that we need to address um, in helping formerly incarcerated get back into the community. We address the needs for housing, we address the needs for, uh, for training, employment, family reunification, and transportation. Right, so there, there, there are many barriers, but I think that we do uh, such an injustice if we do not get into the system early on so we can be able to identify the barriers. We have to be able to go in and, and do a needs assessment and say, what is this person going to need the minute they walk out the back door? and we get out there in front of them to make sure that we can do what, whatever resource we have to be able to put those, put those things together. So, I'm sorry, we've got some other great questions. We just can't get to all of them right now, but I, I think we could probably share John's information <laughs> later on so people can maybe follow up with you directly if, if that's not too presumptuous on my part, John. No, please do. Um, we haven't done uh, enough here today to acknowledge the Thompson Center, uh, Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership. They've been really instrumental in this today. Thank you for everything you've done, the organizational stuff and um, just the, the planning and bringing us together. Um, so uh, before I introduce uh, some folks who have benefited from their interaction from grants from the, from the Thompson Center, I just I want to thank all of our guests from, from Nevada for coming out and um, sharing your experiences with us. What you've done is uh, uh, admirable, and I think we can learn so much from you, and um, thanks for the effort coming out. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I think we're done, yeah. <laughs> Got to kick you guys out of there. We've got about half an hour left. Want to introduce uh, two folks who are recipients of uh, the Thompson Center Research uh, Grants. Dr. Tina Freiberger is uh, Dean of the Helen Bader School of Social Welfare here at, uh, at UW-Milwaukee. She is, uh, boy, she's got, she's done so many impressive things. I, I hope I can do her justice. Um, has spent a lot of uh, time and effort researching courts, sentencing, juvenile justice, racial and ethnic issues in the criminal justice system, evaluates programs related to juvenile offending, mental health needs of youth, and the effectiveness of work programs for probationers and parolees, among many other things. Uh, she's the recipient of a Thompson Center research grant to assess a vocational training program 
to prepare Wisconsin's prison population for skilled employment, and a whole bunch more. I hope I did you a little bit of justice there. Thank you for joining us. Dr. David Pate. Dr. Pate is the chair uh, and associate professor of the Helen Bader School of Social Welfare here. Also uh, an affiliated associate professor of the Institute for Research on Poverty at UW-Madison uh, and an affiliate with the UW-Milwaukee Institute for Child and Family Well-Being. Uh, Dr. Pate uses qualitative research methods to examine life course events of African American men and boys and uh, is also the recipient of a Thompson Center research grant. Uh, this one to examine services for returning incarcerated persons transitioning back into their communities. So I'm hoping each of you can share your experiences and knowledge with us. And again, I just want to encourage folks in the audience and at home just to uh, text or use the link to send questions in and then we can have a question and answer uh, period in, in, in 15 minutes. And then we'll have 15 minutes for questions and I hope that works out. So. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, and hello, every, hello everyone, I'm happy to be here. Uh, so I do wanna say that this, is, this project was uh, the result of a grant from the Tommy Thompson Foundation. Uh, and I did work with a co-PI, Rebecca Conkle. Oh, can't hear me, thank you. Is that better? Would it, be, would it be better to use this one? All right, good. All right, there we go. Okay, uh, I worked with a co-PI, Rebecca Conkle. She couldn't be here today, but she is also uh, in the Helen Bader School of Social Welfare and Assistant Professor in Criminal Justice and Criminology. Um, so this project was an evaluation of a work program that's done in Wisconsin prisons. Uh, and just to kind of give some context to our study uh, as an introduction, you know, we find that about 75% of all incarcerated individuals return actually back to prison, that they recidivate. Uh, and when asking them, asking individuals who are incarcerated what they're most concerned about, uh, one of the things that comes up, the majority of them say that they're concerned about their ability to find employment and to find sustainable employment uh, that can pay a living wage in which that they can support themselves and their families. Uh, and we find that employment is in fact highly correlated with success, with um, decreases in recidivism. Um, and individuals face a lot of challenges and a lot of roadblocks in securing employment. So they have discrimination and stigma associated with previously being incarcerated, as well as we also find really lar large pay gaps. So when, oftentimes when they do find employment, it's for lower paying jobs. Uh, and there's a large pay gap between those who are incarcerated and those who have not. So, you know, the question is, what can we do about this, right? How can we change our outcomes? And some of the things in literature that have been found to be successful is to offer some kind of vocational and employment programming while people are incarcerated, and also giving them real work experience while they're incarcerated. Uh, and we also, it's very important that they're in professions where they can find jobs and find jobs very quickly after, the, after they leave the institution. Because uh, all of these things have been strongly linked to lower recidivism. So the program that we evaluated was the CNC program, uh, and it is a, I'm not a technical person, I'm a social scientist.
at the demographic factors, you know, we see there was about 10 women, 15 men. Um, and you look at race, I think that this is especially interesting, um, which is not up there, so you can't look at race. Uh, but we see that the majority of individuals, thank you, uh, were white. And um, when we look at the full sample, so as I mentioned, we are doing a quantitative piece to this study, we see a similar thing, where the majority of the individuals who have participated in the CNC uh, are, are white. It's about 67%. Um, and that's likely due to the fact that there's a lot of requirements to get into the program. And while those things are probably necessary for people to be prepared to enter into the program, we really want to be careful that we're taking a very close look at things like that because that's how we really get a lot of discrimination into our criminal justice system. So it's a lot of times not overt discrimination. It's instead having these criteria that match some people's past experiences better than other people's past experiences. So this is kind of a red flag here that I think it would be a wise for the program to kind of step back and, and look at what's going on there because we know that over 40% of our prison population in the state is black. Um, so clearly we're, we're selecting uh, individuals into the program that doesn't represent the actual population. Also of these 25, all of them had a high school or GED diploma, which a lot of our prison population again does not. Um, as we look some more, so um, when we look at their employment backgrounds, most of them had been employed, uh, quite a few of them had, had been fired in the past, and the majority of them had length of employment that was 36 months or, or uh, sorry, under 36 months. Uh, if we look at employment six months before incarcerated, again, most people were, and most of them were uh, employed full time. And then if we look at the average hours worked, it's a little bit skewed because of all the zeros. It was really the median was closer to that 40 hours. And then the average pay was about $12 an hour. However, that was pretty heavily skewed by the fact Sorry, by the fact that two of our individuals had committed white collar crimes while they were employed at jobs that were really well paying jobs. Uh, so they kind of skewed that hourly average where if we looked at the medium, it was about, it was more, it was closer to me, uh, minimum wage. Okay, so the results from our focus groups is that the participants stated that they were in need of well paying jobs, a stable career, and they were really concerned about having an employer who was willing to hire them despite their criminal record. And they all discussed a need to provide for themselves and their children, so make a livable wage. They felt that CNC would allow them to have stable and well-paid job, and it would be a stepping stone, it would be a career that they could advance in, that they could make more money in uh, as they went forward. And it could help them build respect and trust in others, like the last panel talked about, a lot of it is just giving people a chance and then letting them prove themselves so then that they can then you know go from there and also they felt that it would give them a better chance of desisting from crime for the program improvement all the program improvement actually came from our male participants and a lot of them talked about really the need for some kind of community release where they could actually go out into the community because these you remember uh, the women went to Gateway College and took their classes where the men uh, were in the trailer on the prison grounds. They also asked for a larger classroom, more access to machines, more time to practice. And I will tell you, they, were, they allowed us to tour the trailer when we were doing the study. It's really tight in there. It's a very small trailer. They're all in there, and those machines are humongous. So I think that that's a you know, that, that, that's a reasonable request. Uh, and just more hands-on kind of training and things that would allow them to kind of advance their skills as they go. Okay. Looking at their thoughts about finding employment, uh, most of them thought it would be easy or very easy to find employment. And uh, they felt that they could retain that employment and that they were satisfied with the program. Uh, they also hoped to make an average of about $16, $17 an hour when they were out. And before I came here earlier, when I was in my office, I just kind of looked up a quick search of what these jobs are paying currently in our community. 
and I found anywhere from 21 to $27 an hour. So it's probably, we know what the labor market is like today, so that's probably driven uh, this up a little bit, which is a good thing. And then there's also room for advancement, which is an even better thing. Um, when we did the interviews with the key staff, you know, a lot of what was said in the last panel really just highlights what was said to the key staff said. They just said that the participants, the students were incredibly dedicated, a lot of really great teamwork. Um, one of the instructors said this is the first time ever that individual has had a class that had straight A's. And that's including all the individuals who are incarcerated who went through the class, as well as all the community members who went through the class. So just very high performing. Uh, but then the staff also did agree that some of the requirements were just a little bit too high. There was a very long waiting list for the men at RCI to get into the program. So just having a greater capacity for individuals. So if we talk about some of the challenges, challenges of our study, so as I mentioned, we had planned to do a quantitative assessment of the program also. So we worked with Wisconsin DOC to also get data on all the individuals who are in the program, as well as all the individuals who were released from the same, same institutions that they were released from in order to do a comparison of the individuals who received this training and those who did not. Um, when we tried to do the analysis, we were missing a lot of data and we couldn't run uh, a reliable analysis with it. So I have been working um, this whole time, this was actually, it's been over a year, with Wisconsin DOC to clean that up and to make sure that we have the data that we need. And we just finally uh, were able to do that last week. So I don't have that analysis available, but if you're interested, I'm happy to share it with you when, you, with you when we do. Uh, but we're gonna look at a comparison of recidivism rates to see if this has impacted uh, individuals' rates of recidivism. Um, and just some conclusions. Uh, again, you know, we'll have the full statistical analysis. Uh, that'll be forthcoming. Uh, but overall, the qualitative assessment looks like it's a very favorable program, that the participants found it to be a helpful program. They felt, you know, confident that they would be able to find employment afterwards, and the staff also was very confident that they would be able to find employment. Um, so that's it. Thank you, Tina. Um, my my uh, research focuses on a purely qualitative exploratory audit design research project. The way this project came about was that I was approached by a number of agencies within the city of Milwaukee to look at what are some of the inefficiencies as well as the effectiveness of reentry programs in the city of Milwaukee. Um, there, my work has been with men since 1997 in the city of Milwaukee where I've done a number of exploratory work and a number of research projects that really raised a, a number of issues that um, where men had all the well intentions and motivation to be employed, maintain employment, but there was often a number of policies that would hamper their ability to be in that employment, uh, anywhere from child support payments to administrative sanctions to a number of other issues that I fully didn't understand and so I was really excited that a number of agencies wanted to um, do this exploratory audit um, project, but also very excited that Tommy Thompson wanted to, the center wanted to fund this opportunity for me to see, just explore for an exploratory matter, uh, where what was going on in the city of Milwaukee, and also what were some of the concerns that were being raised by men who were returning from prison with a number of offenses. Um, as you can see um, in the next slide, there's a number, there's a number of agencies that worked with me. Um, um, all of them were involved in the proposal that we submitted, and all of them worked with me. Men and women um, who were who offered this to deliver services, but also who offered who were recipients of services, um, so that we can have a, a better idea of when we want to do a fuller grant, um, which we'll talk about later. I'll talk about later um, what we could what we could learn from them. Um, next slide. Um, as you can see here, there's three things that I wanted to highlight, and I, I forgot to print out my papers like my dean did, so I feel very inefficient here. But um, I have it on my phone, so but I can't see everything. <laughs> but one of the things that's really important about this project is that Wisconsin has the highest rate of incarceration of black males. Um, and so this project focuses solely on black men and what are some of the barriers that black men face, in particular when they're returning to a city like Milwaukee where the population is 43% 
and above some time. Also, we wanted to, also the, all of the partners were really concerned that we were having repetitive services, offering some of the same things in, in multiple spaces, but maybe there could be a better way of efficiently, efficiently using dollars from federal and state agencies that offer this money for, like for example, driver license recovery. Maybe there needed to be one or two of those places as opposed to maybe three or four, um, which I wasn't aware of. And one thing about this project that I liked, I was truly someone who was naive and ignorant of this topic. I don't study criminal justice issues in the way that my dean does, but I wanted to go in there very naive and be someone who was learning the whole time as what does work and how do people get services. So just like the people who were my partners who knew a lot of information, um, it was an opportunity for me to learn with, the, with them um, what really does make a difference and what doesn't. So this was really, again, our audit of, uh, time of learning this. And thirdly, um, this is an issue that generally both sides of the party want to see. They want to see they want, people want safety, and people don't want people returning to jail necessarily. Um, so they really want, this is an issue that I thought we could really get some collaboration around uh, from a political vantage point, but also from a community vantage point of what we could do to move these men into a space where they were um, able to be self-sufficient, but also take care of their families and take care of themselves without consistently using having the system um, be something they were a part of. Next slide. So the, the objective of our, of our explore, study was really to educate and mobilize stakeholders who affect returning incarcerated citizens. That was the main objective. I wanted to really know what were the issues that people face, what worked, what didn't work. When you're in prison, what was the transition to back to the city? What are you told? What is the post-release, pre-release? How do you work with a parole officer? I know this is a different name for parole officer now. They're called a community something. But anyway, I should know that, right? But I don't know it right now, but it'll come to me in a few minutes. But it was really me really trying to, and I'm someone who studies policy as opposed to behavior. I look at how do policies affect people's behavior and how do policies may help, help uh, have people make decisions that are for, uh, that are supposedly in their best interest. The next, the other part of this uh, project was to use this data to derive the realignment of the existing reentry service landscapes um, to, so that is at scale with the risk, need, responsivity of Milwaukee's returning population. Um, to really look at when someone is returning back to Milwaukee, how do you reduce their risk of re recidivism? How do you reduce the risk that they violated something? How do you reduce the risk that also, of also them not knowing? Um, and I'd like, for example, in some states, people who have been incarcerated can't get food stamps, but not all men know that who are returning, or they can't get housing, and they can't live in the same area, or they can't get a job based on their, their previous uh, criminal behavior. So um, it was just really important for me to do a lot of listening with a lot of people. So the methods that I used were qualitative methods that primarily consisted of focus groups and some interviews. I looked at a lot of descriptive data, and then I did some content analysis to see what were the major themes that were coming up over time. Um, with the participant groups, I was in, it was important for me to talk to anyone who had committed a felony of some type and released from prison. And what it, our group was very interested in not only having um, the populations that we generally talk about, but also I did a special focus group with men who were sexual offenders, because I just didn't understand that population myself, and it's a population that I had a hypothesis that, and generally qualitative researchers don't have a hypothesis, but my hypothesis was there is nothing for that group because of moral and state issues about what the crime is they have committed. And so I had a, um, a group of 10 men who were identified as sexual offenders, um, thanks to the help of Project Return. And then I had another group of uh, 13 men um, who, were, who had committed a variety of other felonies and interviewed both of those groups uh, for about over two and a half hours, talking about just what, is their, what has been their transition from prison to home and what were all the barriers they faced. Um, they, their salary amongst the group was less than $12,000 a year. Um, even though it was interesting, one of the men in the group that I talked to had a PhD um, and had committed a crime as a student. Yeah, what, is the, what am I learning here that we can use for a, lar uh, a bigger grant? We also did a, a major 
uh, focus groups I did with uh, provider groups. And that was with 19 um, Milwaukee-based agencies. Um, the total number of participants in that group was 42. Um, there was, uh, the majority of them were males, ages 32 to 75. The average years of service was 13 years. Um, and they worked in a variety of areas that you can see listed on the slide that's up there. Um, the majority of them, in terms of the number of clients, I remember asking how many people, how many clients they all served collectively. And there was over 10, almost 10,000 people they had served collectively. So I had a good idea that they knew what they were talking about. And the majority of them worked with the male population um, because I was focusing on males. Some of the primary themes that I heard from the men was this whole issue of survival. And survival to the point that when you are let out and your immediate thing that I didn't know was that you had to meet with your PO immediately within those first 24 hours brought up all different kinds of issues from transportation to I don't know how to navigate the city anymore, how to use the cell phone, which, which bus do I use or when do I get off or who do I talk to or how do I even reacclimate to being in society um, was something I heard a lot from these men. So it was an issue of survival and as well as survival within the community they came from because if they don't know any place other than their own community that was problematic. Uh, the issues of surveillance was a big issue for many of these men they talked about that they're always in a space where they really still are not free from the prison system. Um, someone is consistently watching them um, or watching their behavior so they don't do anything so it makes, a, makes them feel as if they have no choice but to do a bad behavior sometimes. Um, but that was an issue as well. Uh, the lack of support, um, many of the men said that they knew they had someone who was going to support them when they came home, even before they came home, that made a big difference in their transition to being in a healthier and safer space. Um, so the whole idea of support was really in some of the programs I talked to who provided pre-release support. That's what many of the men were saying was the best part of why they were able to return to a job or return home or reconnect to their children because the prison allowed for more pre-release uh, services. Uh, capitalism and what that means for many of them in terms of I have to work hard and if I work hard then I'll do better. Um, and for some of them who had been in and out of prison, the whole idea that they did work hard but some of the administrative sanctions made their life a little more difficult, did not allow for them to really do what was expected of someone in America based on how we define um, meritocracy and the idea of working hard. The last two is relationships. So relationships are very important. Um, it, it, provided on the, it depended on the service provider they had, for example, for pre-release and post-release. That made a difference, but also relationships, relationships, if they hadn't burned bridges with their own family, made a big, big difference for them being able to do better. And lastly, uh, mental health. I'm sorry, I keep turning around. Um, mental health was a big issue that I think that we don't often um, even think about for men, period. That's men across all race, that we don't think that they also don't have issues of trauma and issues of depression. And I have often seen within the city of Milwaukee with many of the people I've interviewed over time that I think people normalize what they consider normal behavior but they really are depressed. And because people have also not normalized that going to a therapist is not a bad thing, it could often be a good thing for you. But for many of these men, they talked about the idea that their mental health stat status did not allow them to work, did not allow them to reacclimate at the same um, level of speed that they, people desired them to do that. Uh, next slide. I have to turn it out. Some of the comments, and I'm only going to read, I'm not going to read all of these comments because we have very little time and I have a child to pick up at five, at six o'clock, so I have to be sure that we do, that we, I don't have to, but anyway, I got a kid to pick up. Um, when, I, when I get out, when I did get out, I forgot how a car moved and I only did a, and I only did a year. I forgot how that, a car really, be rolling on four wheels and I could just sit in the passenger seat and we'd just be driving. I got in the car feeling weird. I ain't been in the car in a minute. And when one of the men said that to me, I was, I took a car ride for granted. I don't even think about why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you be acclimated to being in a car? But when you've been living in a prison system that tells you when to get up, when to eat, when to shower, when to go to bed, you know, the, your, your, your mind has to make a big transition to being able to make independent decisions, which takes time. So that was one of the things I've learned about the whole idea of who, how do I look at access to mental health when I do a bigger project or do people access mental health? Not assuming everyone has a mental health issue, but mental health can be as simple as I don't know how to do things and I just need someone to give me some guidance on what I need to do so I can feel good about who I am. Next slide. 
Housing is a gigantic one. I'm sure everyone can, act, can uh, appreciate. Housing is good for someone, it's bad for someone, even if you've never been in prison. Um, we live in a system where if you need housing and you're someone who doesn't have a whole lot of resources, um, you're going to be homeless. And so many of the men I talked to had made some choices that probably weren't the right choices by connecting with someone as a place for a place to live that may not have been the right choice, um, and therefore that may have caused other issues. But housing was brought up consistently. Um, in fact, all the men I talked to had housing, and those men who were sexual offenders, that was, that was, that was just two of the men in, my, in that study I had in 2018 were living on the street and brought their shopping carts to my focus group, and that was their house. And so it made me really rethink how do I do a bigger project and follow some of these men over a two or three year period, um, which I, I'm, I will talk about in a few minutes. Next slide. Um, also, you know, people don't know, you know, everything they know about me is based on what's been wrote about me. And a lot of men talked about that. People don't really know their stories, and that really gravitated, really made me want to do more work to understand who is this population and how are they really um, treated? You know, how are they really given the opportunities to, do, to be successful as we denote, as we define success? Um, and and uh, again, that was a real issue. So, so those were just some of the things I heard from the men. Next slide. Uh, surveillance I already talked about. Um, provide, so let's go to the provider theme. So the providers I talked to gave these themes is that they really needed additional funding. Um, the fact that they wanted a chance to have policies on the amount of time services are available to return, that they wanted a change in that. They wanted to improve relationships with probation officers and that's a part that we're gonna explore. And the need for more coordination of services was something that was brought up by all the providers I talked to. They see a, a significant need for many of them who are all chasing the same dollars to not always just harm each other by in the competition that has had, um, that occurs. Um, some of the things that they talked about also was the access to services, it could be better. Um, they think that some of these pre-release services unfortunately are not available until 60 days before release, which often is not enough time for these men to be prepared to re re return home. Um, they also thought that Time is a barrier often for these men. Uh, they felt that often these men don't come, uh, they, they come out doing the job right away, but it's not what they should do because they're just not ready, and this is from the providers. And also the fault that they feel that the fallacy of reentry began by calling it reentry because they're not reentering. Um, we're respecting them to, re to enter a part of society that they've never been a part of. And that was something I heard consistently from a lot of these men as well. Um, not of the providers, not the men. The men talked about it, but the providers were very strong in their thoughts about that. Uh, I'm gonna skip over the next two because I really wanna get to, the, I know we don't have much time. Um, if you can go to the slide is what are the obstacles of giving them your services? The one thing is that people live in these silos and so therefore some of the men may need a variety of things and they have to send the men all over the city to get what they may need, what they may need to, to do a job that they need to do. And that could be problematic based on what their offense has been or the neighborhood they're going to. So therefore, if they do that, then they will violate, they'd be in violation and they can't get the services they need. But also at the same time, many of the people who are providing the services, which I thought was really cool, was that many of them themselves had experienced some incarceration. And so they, had, they were talking not just from the fact that they worked with these men, but they had, some of them had experienced this um, particular uh, phenomenon of, of incarceration and at, at the same time had, but were able to see it through a different lens than I would see it. Um, I think that, if you go to the next slide, I think there's one more. Some of the policy and practice implications that we talked about was um, having better improved pre-release programs um, improving access to job readiness and employment programs, improving in coordination and collaboration of social service providers. Um, so many of these men, and so many of the service providers I talked to, even though many of the, pre many of the service providers in this project were men, um, some people just still are not comfortable providing service to men for whatever reason, and I think they need to have better training on that. Increasing access to health services, because so many of these men, when they come out, don't have the same health care they had when they were incarcerated. Um, and that's a real issue. And the whole idea that we're looking at is improving the efficiency of the reentry services. Now, once we were able to do this very exploratory audit project, we immediately submitted a grant to do a bigger, pro bigger five-year project um, of a million dollars. 
and we got funded. Um, I'm the principal investigator for that project as well, and we're following 40 men, or we're going to follow 40 men, and I'm going to have them have a, a I'm, I'm going to, once I get the IRB approved, which I hope someday it happens, <laughs> I want these men to be able to connect with me when anything happens to them over the next two years in particular. For the last three years, unfortunately, we've had two years of COVID, which has prevented us from doing any research. And, we, and I do not want to do the research via Zoom or some other telepathic way of talking to people. I really want to be able to get to know these men. Um, I've done this type of research before where I followed men for two years. It was my dissertation about 20 years ago. Uh, not 20 years ago, but close to 20 years ago. And I would like to repeat that, but this time with the focus on just what are the barriers from the second they become, once they're released um, and they connect with me, and I'm working with, and if you go to the next slide, my partners in the project are Project Return, uh, Employee Milwaukee, uh, Center for Self-Sufficiency, um, I'm forgetting somebody, Community Advocates, and UWM, that's me. And so <laughs> those are the places I'm working with um, who are gonna provide me with the men. Um, we're gonna have, of course, oversample, but I'm gonna have 40, hopefully consistently have 40 men um, working with a research assistant to document just what is, what are the barriers and to come out of that with hopefully significant policy, policy changes that looks at particularly issues of administrative sanctions, which really are policies that a state can change that better, that allows people more access to safety and well-being. So I'll stop there and go on and take any questions, I guess, before I have to go get my kid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are running a little bit short on time, and I don't want you to be late uh, picking up your child. Uh, this will be a tough question. It's so complicated. I think we just proved there are so many facets to this that we have to take a, a further look at. Could each of you maybe just boil it down, and if you can, just give me you know, two or three of the most important things we can do, particularly in Milwaukee or Wisconsin, to reduce recidivism? Uh, I know that's a tough question. I know a lot more qualita or quantitative work has to be done, but can you focus on just a couple things that you, you think we ought to, uh, we, we, we here ought, ought to focus on? Tough question. That's a really tough question, but I would say us here, one thing is just to have kind of an open mindset, like you was talked about too in the last panel, and you know, is a theme is, you know, to encourage businesses to give people a chance. I mean, because we need, those individuals need a chance, and also those businesses need those employees. So there really is a win-win, and we do have a workforce that is being left out at a time that we need more people in our workforce. So it really is a good opportunity. And I work quite a bit with the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, and you know they have been kind of a one of the leaders in the country on rehabilitation, uh, and their whole mantra and what they you know tell all of their employees is they're like today's incarcerated individual is tomorrow's neighbor. So the way that we treat individuals when they're incarcerated is gonna impact who they are when they leave and how prepared they are to leave. So I think that that is a really great saying. I think it's important for all of us to remember that and to continue to kind of send that message. And you know, we talk about, you know, my study looks at one thing, like one job training program. And that's really one thing, but you notice with the themes of the panel before with David's study, it's giving people another identity to latch on to. Like, you know, we know symbolic interactionism theory, labeling theory, you know, giving people the, the tools and the ability and the confidence to say that I'm more than just a person who was involved in the justice system. I, I, I don't want to say much more than what Tina's already said. I just think that the whole idea of giving people the opportunity but also looking at which policies in place is really what I'm trying to do here. Mm -hmm. Which policies have we developed that no one's paying attention to that's really uh, really providing us a challenge? Uh, and that policy can be e possibly easily changed with some data that shows if you just change this or whatever this is, it can make a difference in someone being able to maintain a job and not be what you might see as a cost to the state. Um, and and I, don't, I don't think people have really done that because we tend to forget about this population. And so therefore, I, I would really recommend for those who are in policy arenas to really think, examine which policies really provide um, a challenge to someone really being able to re-enter into society. 
Dr. Pate, Dr. Freiberger, thank you very much for sharing. I can't wait to hear the rest of it because I know you guys are kind of in midstream and there's so much more that's going to be done in the next couple of years. So hopefully we can get together again at some point and, and hear the rest of the story. Thank you so much. Um, uh, on the behalf of the Badger Institute, I want to thank Peter and Odyssey and the folks at the Lubar Center uh, for working with us. I wanted to hand over the microphone to the Thompson Center again. Thank you so much for uh, for. Uh, sharing this time with us and helping us organize this. So I'm, I'm going to uh, hand it over to you for the wrap up. Great. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Alex Tock. I'm the director of the Thompson Center. Uh, I just want to end here. I thought uh, this was a tremendous event by uh, thanking everybody uh, for uh, John Ponder, for all of our panelists, um, for uh, Tina and David for talking about. Uh, some of the research uh, they've done and um, that we helped fund. Um, and uh, I apologize if we uh, didn't get time for uh, to ask your questions. We're happy to pass along contact information so uh, we can get you uh, answers. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for attending. Thank you, everybody from the Badger Institute, the Odyssey Project, um, from uh, UWM and the School of Public Health here. Um, uh, this has been great. This is our first event of the year. If you're interested in more of our events, uh, please uh, go to our website um, and uh, also encourage you to check out our, our co-sponsors. Um, and for those of you who are here in person, please help yourself to more food. We have uh, plenty of food. And for those of you who are remote, thank you for uh, bearing with us as we do our first uh, live stream event. We've already they learned a lot from doing it this time. Um, I hope you were able to enjoy it, and uh, thank you again. Okay.